Hello, friends. Welcome to today's discussion with uh, Paula Valent and Stan Druckenmiller. I'm Bob White, and I'm going to make some brief introductions and then hand it over to Paula and Stan. But before I do that, just a couple of minor administrative things. First, closed captioning is available. And you'll see that option at the bottom of your screen. Um, today, we have a live question and answers. The event, you can submit any questions you'd like to ask Stan or Paula at any time through the Q&A function. And finally, this event is being recorded and will be posted in the reunion and alumni relations sites. So again, thank you for joining us. And let me give a little brief, brief, brief background on Paula and on Stan. First with Paula, Paula came to Bowdoin 21 years ago uh, in July 2000, soon became the vice president for investments and currently serves as our senior vice president and chief investment officer of the college. When Paula came, the endowment was $465 million. Through the generous donations from you alums and family and friends and the incredible investment performance under Paula's leadership, the endowment is well over $2 billion today. Bowdoin's, Bowdoin's endowment has achieved top decile growth performance over the short term and the long term horizons under her guidance. As we all know, Paula will soon be stepping down from her role, we'll miss her, and be joining Rockefeller University in August as the Vice President and Chief Investment Officer. And we uh, wish her good luck in that exciting new chapter. Prior to investment in, 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 in um, investment management, she ran her own business as an art conservator. She also worked in the National Gallery of Arts in Washington, Los Angeles County Museum, uh, Palace of Fine Arts in San Francisco, and the New York Historical Society. So she has quite a varied background. She currently serves as a director of MSCI, Board of Advisors of Yale School of Management, member of the Investment Committee of the Pitts Family Foundation, member of the Advisor Committee of Women Who Invest in um, uh, Girls Who Invest, trustee of the um, Skohegan School of Art and Painting, an investment committee member of the Rockefeller Foundation. She graduated from University of New Hampshire, master's degree in art history from the Institute of Fine Arts in New York University, MBA from um, the Yale School of Law and trained prior to joining Bowdoin under David Swenson at, um, at Yale Investment Office. In 2020, Barron's named Paula one of the 100 most influential women in US finance. So Paula, thanks for taking time to be with us today. Looking forward to hearing from you and Stan. So let me go now to give a little background on Stan. First of all, Stan needs no introduction, but I'll, but I'll do it anyway. He obviously is a, a legendary investor class of Bowdoin 1975. Stan started at Dreyfus, uh, Dreyfus, moved to the Soros Fund Management where he would ultimately have responsibility to run the world's largest hedge fund. He went on to found Duquesne Management and currently is a private investor and widely regarded as one of the preeminent money managers in the world. Stan has been a loyal son of Bowdoin and has never forgotten the place that he loved so much. In, 2000, in 1999, Stan joined the board of Bowdoin and served until 2002 as an active uh, member of the board of trustees. In 1991, when he joined the board, he joined the investment committee and he has served for the last 30 years as a member of the Bowdoin Board of Investment Committee. Uh, active trend, well, as an active uh, trustee as well as a trustee emeriti. He chaired the board from 97 to, two, uh, chaired the committee from 2097 um, to 2001. And then again, 2015 through today. Through his treasure, he has supported and become the major benefactor of the college. And with his time, he has been an incredible and trusted advisor and confidant for three Bowdoin presidents and the Bowdoin board. His success in his business is matched by his incredible and remarkable record of philanthropy. He has a long and distinguished record of serving the common good. He's a major benefactor and chairman of the board of trustees of Harlem Cholich uh, Zone. Center for Strategic and International Studies Environmental Events Fund, uh, Memorial Kidding Cancer Center. 
He was recognized by the Chronicle of um, Philanthropy as the most charitable man in America, giving hundreds of millions of dollars to organizations that support medical research, education, environment, anti-poverty, and others. In 2007, Dr. Druckenmiller was awarded an honorary degree by the college. And in 2015, he was the co-recipient of the Bowdoin Prize with Jeff Canada, Bowdoin's highest honor, awarded each of five years to the graduate, a former member of the college, a member of the faculty at the time who has made there at that time the most distinctive contribution in any field of human endeavor. Stan, thank you for all that you've done for the college and for so many others. And thanks for joining us today. So Stan, thanks. thanks, Bob, and uh, welcome everybody and all the polar bears out there. Um, I wanna start by thanking Paula. Um, it's just hard to overstate what an achievement this remarkable woman has, has handed us over the last 20 years. Um, Bowdoin just hasn't been top decile. She's been number one many times and most of the time, and my guess is throughout that period. And the difference that makes for the college is immeasurable. Uh, to have an endowment go from the 400s to well over 2 billion um, changes the landscape of what we can do with financial aid. It changes the landscape of our competitive position by others. And I, Bob's right, I served under three great presidents. I have to say that, that no one has had more of a transformational effect on Bowdoin than Paula Valent. I'm often asked, um, what makes her so good? Because the numbers really are outstanding. Um, the first thing I would say, and I'll say this affectionately, and it's not an insult, Paula, because I've heard the term used on me. She's, an, she's a workaholic. Um, she has a work ethic like nothing I've ever seen. Sometimes when I call her to say hello, I can't get done with the second syllable before she's into the investment um, talk. She just loves our business with a passion, and she works at it like no one I've ever seen. Bob mentioned, um, that she has an art history background and had a curator business. I strongly believe the diversity in her background gives her an ability to think out of the box and innovate that you just don't get much in the financial industry. People tend to go through finance. They are consensus thinkers. Um, Paula coming from such a varied background and it didn't hurt to have a mentor like David Swenson um, has innovated and had a bunch of ideas at Bowdoin that by hindsight, they look easy, but they were, they were not easy. And they were very aggressive, which is the other thing I'll say about her. She's not afraid to swing the bat. And you don't get the kind of performance she's had without taking enormous risks. And it's hard to explain, I've been in the business for over 40 years, how taxing that is emotionally, how traumatizing it is, and she's done it time after time with great success. Finally, a lot of the places she's invested with, they weren't easy to get into. Um, but the work ethic, and I don't know whether it's relentlessness, where they just want to get her off the phone and they can't take it anymore, or they're in love with her or whatever, but we've gotten into so many closed funds and held those relationships because of Paula. All this to me has sort of been a great mixture um, as to why Paula has achieved the stunning results she's achieved. Now, Paula, I know that the format is you're supposed to interview me, but I have one question for you because no aspect of our investment performance has been more transformational to our returns than our venture capital portfolio. And I'm sad to say I had absolutely nothing to do with going into that field and pushing that level of investment that we have there. Could you just walk us through what exactly went into that decision, how you sure. pulled the trigger and what you've done since, since, because it wasn't yes, me. Yes, I, I, I want to be brief because this is about you, Stan, and thank you everyone. It, I am gonna miss Bowdoin so much. It's been such an honor and I'm a polar bear even though I didn't go to Bowdoin. Um, as you know, I joined in 2000, right in the teeth of when the dot-com bubble was bursting. 
Um, and Bowdoin at that time had very little in BC. It's funny, when I came to um, Ham House and worked under Kent Chabotar, I opened the, my drawer and there was a letter from a trustee and it said, I don't want to introduce you to Matrix, Kleiner Perkins, um, Greylock, and someone wrote on the bottom, too risky for a college. So Bowdoin did not invest in venture capital when Yale and some of the others did. In some ways that protected uh, the college in 2000 from the downturn, although the college did, poor timing, invest in a, a fund of funds in VC right in March 2000. One of the things that I did at Yale with David Swenson is I helped him write his book, Pioneering Portfolio Management. And David was a real pioneer in alternative asset classes. And he showed how you had to find the best managers. There was only a handful of them, but they had great deal flow. They had innovation, creativity, and also the, the, uh, what you talk about is the courage to to be non-conventional. And so the first year at Bowdoin, I did very little um, change in the portfolio, but I went around, no one from Bowdoin had ever met with an investment manager, except at the, trust, at, at the investment committee meetings really briefly. So I started traveling to Silicon Valley and I, I started selling the Bowdoin brand. And now Bowdoin has an amazing brand around, we're known as really good investors, as thoughtful, good, loyal investors. And the story of Bowdoin is very compelling, the um, financial aid, the um, common good and all of that. So it, it took a while. And as you said, I was relentless and people a lot of times gave me a tiny little bit thinking that I would turn away and be insulted, but I did that. So I'm very proud of that. Let's move into talking about you. And so in some ways, in many ways, you are a legend at Bowdoin. Um, and during your undergrad years, particularly, there's many sort of, you know, myths, uh, stories about you. You were not in a fraternity, although some people claim you were, because there's a picture of you in a fraternity. You ran the game room, and through that, you got to meet lots of different uh, people at Bowdoin, students from all different backgrounds. You ran casinos, you walked dogs to make money, and you and Larry Lindsay, ran a, who uh, many people know, ran a hot dog stand. Summers, you worked construction and you made you work maintenance on a golf course, and you thought you were going to be an English professor. Um, and then, like me, you have been a mentor to me. David Swenson has been a mentor. There's people um, at, at, in art that have been mentors to me. You had a, free, a few great mentors. So, what at Bowdoin, particularly during that time, influenced you to where you are today, which is amazing. Well, thank you for those. Kind words. Um, you're right, I started off as an English major. I actually completed the major, but um, I wasn't very competitive. Back then, we didn't have A, B, Cs, and Ds. We had honors and high honors. And then, my, no matter how hard I worked, I couldn't get above one of these H's um, in English. And I, I don't like to lose. And uh, it just wasn't working. My junior year, I took course in economics, uh, just so I felt I could read the paper properly, because I didn't really understand the world and how it worked. And uh, I took a class from Bill Shipman, and it was literally like the lights came on. Um, the concept of um, the invisible hand, thinking on the margin, marginal cost, I was just in love with it. And strangely, I was also very good at it. I, I was a mediocre student in English. I excelled in economics. Um, and then I met another professor, uh, Myrick Freeman, who taught microeconomics and environmental economics. And he became a very a incredible mentor to me. And I can remember a lot of times going over his house, the fireplace, so it's the traditional um, romantic story about a liberal arts education, but in this case, it's true. And uh, he and actually Professor Shipman guided me to go get a PhD in economics. I wanted to be a professor. Uh, I went to Michigan. Um, after about one month, I figured out this wasn't for me. These guys are into these models that they're trying to jam the world into a model that to me, you can't do that. And uh, more importantly, they believed in them, which I found really frightening. 
I stayed there about a semester and a half and uh, left and uh, went back and got a job in construction in Vermont. Um, I had a practice marriage to a voting girl that lasted about a year and a half. Um, went to Pittsburgh with her and got a job at Pittsburgh National Bank. So that's sort of the background of Bowdoin. I, the interesting thing about Bowdoin, I was a very sheltered kid from Virginia, which in 1971 is really sheltered because they were still living in the 18th century. And uh, you're right, in the game room, I met everybody. I met hockey players, I met African Americans, I met I met the whole brand of the college that would go through that, that game room. And uh, I spent a lot of time there and that was pretty much uh, my fraternity or my social experience. But so uh, you went to uh, Pittsburgh National Bank and then you were very successful. I think that your game, your interest in games and sort of playing games, I know you're a big football uh, fan as well, but um, after only one year, you became the head of the um, bank's equity research group. Um, and then you joined, I think Dreyfus asked you at, for in for consulting, you joined Dreyfus in 1985 and you started, you launched one of the best performing mutual funds um, records for all time, which brought you to the attention of George Soros. Um, and George Soros also is legendary. I think you read his book, Alchemy and Finance, and you requested a meeting in October 1987. And if you look back on markets in 19, 1987 was a big time in markets. So um, you actually uh, were trading against Soros in the big drawdown. You were profitable, and I think he was very impressed. So you can, can you look back on that and also Soros hired you and probably you're most famous for uh, taking down the Bank of England by shorting Sterling in 1992, which was later. But, you know, when you um, I think that's really amazing that you reached out to George Soros because you read his book. And I just wanted you to sort of go back on that period, especially when you found out that the giant or the elephant in the market was him. OK, so. Most of that is correct. Um, I was really promoted too early at Pittsburgh National. I was made the boss of a bunch of 40 year olds when I was 25. And I had never had a course in accounting or business. Like you, I came from a completely different background. I had had some economics, obviously. And because I didn't get formal balance sheet trading, I kind of morphed early on into trading currencies. I also started as a bank analyst. So in the liquidity, currencies, bonds, trading all sorts of asset classes. And the only one who was really doing that at that time that was well known was Soros. Um, and yes, I read his book on uh, Alchemy of Finance, which I wouldn't recommend to anybody. It's the hardest <laughs> book to read, doesn't make a lot of sense, but there was one chapter in there that really caught my eye and it was on currencies. So I did call him up and yes, um, we started talking two weeks before the crash. Um, I'll just say that that quarter ended up being the best quarter in my history. I think I was up like 60% for the quarter and he got killed and it turned out um, the Thursday morning after the crash, the reason I was able to cover my short position so well was someone at Solomon Brothers told me uh, there was an elephant in the marketplace that was dumping. So I covered everything. And when I talked to Soros on Friday, I said, some idiot blew out 5,000 <laughs> S&Ps on the opening. And um, I covered everything. I was very embarrassed when I read Embarrance that Sunday that the idiot was George Soros, maybe arguably at the time, the greatest investor of all time. But that's that's a funny backdrop, yes. That's great. Um, and I won't go into the Bank of England shorting, but that did was amazing. And one of the things that that underlines is what you sort of learned with George Soros is that when you have great conviction on something and you know or feel that thing that you're right, you should put money to it. And your risk management is famous because if you don't know what you're or you're feeling, you take your ex, uh, exposure down. So I think your risk management has been really instrumental in you having one of the best, if not the best track record of any investor over the past 40, 30, 40 years. Um, was that scary? I interviewed Bernanke once and he was telling me one of the scariest parts of, you know, uh, when sitting at his desk, when you did the Bank of England trade 
how, you know, t tell they us. Actually, it actually wasn't scary. And I don't say that cavalierly because I've been scared to death with a, a lot of times during my career. But the background I gave very shortly was, was August of 82, uh, our housing analyst, um, Scott Besson at the time, who was in London, told me that housing was collapsing in, in England. Um, at the same time, Germany had reunited West Germany and East Germany. So their economy was booming and they had an inflation problem. So they wanted rates high. Um, after, after the Weimar Republic, Germans have always been inflation obsessed with inflation. The British wanted rates low because housing was collapsing, but their currencies were linked. So I thought this was unsustainable. So in August of 92, I think Soros fund was 7 billion. I shorted a billion and a half pounds against the Deutsche Mark. And frankly, the reason it wasn't scaring Paula is I knew if the, if the currency broke, it could only break one way. So my risk was to carry, which was 50 basis points over a year. That's all I could lose. But if, if somehow it broke, I would make 20%. So fast forward about a month later, I open up the Financial Times and the head of the Bundesbank um, in very flowering terms were just saying that the relationship was unsustainable and that he didn't think Britain and, and Germany should have their currencies linked because of their two very different economic situations. Soros was rarely in the office and he was off in Eastern Europe doing philanthropy, but he was in, in that afternoon. I went into him and I said, I'm going to increase my my pound bet from a billion and a half to 100% of the fund. And I explained my whole thesis and rationale to him. And he had sort of this disgusted look on his face. And I thought, I'm thinking while he's looking, while I'm talking, uh, how can he not get this? And he says, look, you shouldn't put 100% of the fund in this. You should put 200% of the fund in this because this is a one-way bet. You only get it maybe two or three times in your career where you can't lose and you might make a lot. So I, I totally agreed with him. And instead of trying to get to 7 billion, I decided to get to 15 billion overnight. We ran out at about 7 billion, which is where I want to go to in the first place. And the thing broke. It wasn't scary because I knew I couldn't lose. I, I knew I might not win, but I knew I couldn't lose. About the, the high I got the exhilaration the next morning was almost indescribable. Mm. Uh, but then it got in the press and that wasn't so fun. <laughs> That's investing for you. Um, I know I'm going I know we're running out of time and I also want people to ask questions. So um, the question and answer just go in on there. Um, I see not many people have put questions in, so I'll continue, but I would love to open it up to questions to the audience. Um, in 1991, you re-engaged with Bowdoin um, at the suggestion of Bill Torrey and President Bob Edwards, and you joined the Board of Overseers. And as you said, you've been a loyal alum ever since. I thought it was interesting because I went back and read part of the uh, Ken Chavatar's uh, sort of report for the year that you joined, and it was not a happy report. The college was in a little bit of a financial struggle. Um, he notes positions have been eliminated, salary increases minimized, department budgets diminished, yet many challenges remain on the road to a balanced budget. At that point, the endowment um, spend was 8%, which is above what it was supposed to be, and I think they froze it right after that. And um, Ken ends his, uh, his brief summary with, in short, the financial watchword for the 1990s at Bowdoin College should be, quote, hopeful but cautious. In the 1990s, when you did take over um, and became chair of the investment committee, you were one of the first to put the um, a college endowment into hedge funds. Um, and it's interesting because I was looking back in 19 um, in 1981 when you started founded Duquesne. The rate of five-year treasuries was 15%. Uh, there were a total of eight hedge funds with assets under management of 57 million. Today, there is over four trillion in hedge funds. The five-year treasury is below 1%. And I don't know how many hedge funds quote there are, but that. So um, 
you know, is is the hedge fund? So how has the market changed since you started Duquesne and since you joined the board? I mean, it's changed so dramatically. But what stands out most during that period? Oh my God, um, I think one of the reasons for my success was in 1976 when I entered the business. We've been in a bear market for eight years, and I'll never forget my first father-in-law saying, well, it's a very intellectually stimulating business and you'll have fun, but you're not gonna make any money in this. So the best and the brightest were becoming doctors and other professions. So you didn't have that much talent coming into the financial industry, which was great for me because every time you buy something, you're selling it, you're buying it from somebody selling and vice versa. So the competitive landscape wasn't that good. By the, by the early 2000s, it was the opposite. We had, I was hiring kids that um, had at least 50 IQ points on me, at least. And it was in my mind, the biggest waste because they should be out, you know, writing algorithms or inventing vaccines or stuff like that. And the business has just gotten much, much more competitive. And then the last lurch was with the internet. It's become information overload. When I started, you had to dig for information and the information was hard to find. Now all the information is there and the problem is distilling it. So the business has changed dramatically. And do you wanna make, I know you've been very vocal on the Fed and quantitative easing. And um, in, uh, a few years ago, you and Jeff Canada, Bowdoin alum, Jeff Canada went around and came to Bowdoin actually and spoke to students about their entitlement, the entitlement issues that they were gonna to have to face, which I think are only worse, have become you know, even enlarged since you'd had that talk. So, and I don't think they're, you know, what progress and you know, what future for our children and grandchildren are you expecting if something isn't done? Well, I'm scared to death and it may be beyond the point where something should be done, which is why Jeff and I were going around on this 10 years ago. Every metro we talked about is worse. Um, Obama didn't address it. Trump didn't address it. Biden didn't address it. Um, Trump actually started spending dramatically on other stuff and now Biden has with the exception of one. I was assuming interest rates would be 4% and that would be the cost of the debt. Um, and the fact that interest rates are have been like below one. So the debt has gone, I think it was 9 trillion back then. It's now like 28 trillion. Actually, if you present value the liabilities, it's like 200 trillion. Um, so, you know, I don't, my guess is we've reached a point of no return and at some point, we're gonna either have to raise taxes dramatically or just gonna to have to cut back on the benefits, which is the more likely outcome to our future generations or what you're calling our children and grandchildren. I think my children and grandchildren will be fine. Um, I'm a little bit worried about um, the rest of our, actually I'm very worried about the rest of the kids in our society and where we're headed. And after this question, I am going to open it up to the audience. But one of the things is you have been quoted to say that giving money away properly is a way to satisfy the soul. And you and Fiona have been extremely, as Bob noted, um, devoted to philanthropy, particularly in medical research, education, and the fight against poverty. Um, and I was looking back on what you and Jeff Canada did um, at Harlem Children's Zone, which when you originally went there was the Reedland Center. And can you tell us a little bit about, you know, you, you Harlem Children's Zone is so amazing. And um, I have been a little bit involved in talking to some of the people there and it's just an amazing. So how does Harlem Children's Zone go forward and what's your vision for that since you're one of its visionaries? Yeah, meeting Jeff Cano, who I did not meet when I was at Bowdoin, which is funny because we had all these sort of tangential friends we knew we found out later, but um, that's like hitting the lottery for a philanthropist. Philanthropy is really rewarding because making a difference. Um, I like winning on trades, but winning where you've actually moved the needle, particularly in an area like Harlem is quite exciting. Um, while I was chair, I stepped down as chair a year ago. I had to constantly resist the suggestion of board members 
to go into other cities because we had 100 square blocks in Harlem and I thought we had to stick to our knitting in terms of that job. Since then, um, particularly in the pandemic when, when the plight of people in these kind of neighborhoods was exposed to the extent that it has been, funding has opened up nationally. Um, the other thing that has happened is Jeff also stepped down a few years ago and I hit the lottery when I met Jeff. I didn't think he could hit the lottery twice in the same lifetime, but he's mentored this, this kid. Uh, he didn't go to Bowdoin, he went to this little school called Harvard, um, but he's from the same kind of a background, which is a, a tough, tough circumstance, single mom. He's just one of the most extraordinary, amazing leaders I've ever seen. So the combination of Harlem Children's Zone being imitated in like 200 companies, 200 communities around the country and the globe and having this extraordinary leader and now funding coming into the space. I, I just think the sky's the limit for HCZ and I, I'm as excited about it as I've ever been. Great. All right, I'm gonna, we have lots of questions that have just come in. So let me start, um, I'll start with one, um, which is about the younger alums. What are your thoughts on the younger participation in the equity market and crypto market these days, given the recent news like GME, AMC and Bitcoin? And where is, does this, where are we heading in the investment world given these uh, phenomenon? Well, A, I, I don't know. I'm, one of my comparative advantages is knowing when to change my mind. So you can take anything I say, no matter how convicted I am at the time with a grain of salt. But I will say um, meme stocks like GME and, a, and AMC are, are not, GME, I'm sorry, GameStop, I gave you the symbol. They're not the road to riches long-term. I, I would suggest that you buy great companies early, early in their life cycle. That's, that's a better route. In terms of the market itself, um, we have extraordinary expansionary policy going on. And as long as that's going on, um, we're probably going to have a background similar to what you've seen the last few years. On the other hand, I think we've eaten a lot of our future seed corn and valuations are literally at all time highs, not just for my career, which is 40 years, but all time. So if and when um, this policy feels a need to reverse itself, particularly if we get inflation, which I think is probably a 50, 50 to 70% chance that it's not so-called transitory, um, we could go down to more normal valuations, which would be about 30% lower. So the music's still playing. I have no idea when it's gonna stop, but when it does stop, I think things could be uh, difficult more like the period just before I got into the business from 68 to 75. And, um, you know, you have been, had favorite stocks. I, I want to talk to you about what favorite stocks you think would stand the test of time. You've been a fan of platforms like Amazon, Microsoft, and Google. We just got Lena Khan as the head of the FTC, which I think is not a good thing for those. Um, you know, she's very negative about tech. But um, what is, uh, what are your thoughts on US tech regulation? and also the regulation of Bitcoin crypto, which is happening in China and uh, noises from Gensler. That's one of the questions. Yeah, I'll start with the tech regulation. Um, we need to see what the regulation actually is because sometimes counterintuitively, it doesn't work like you think. So with the banks, when they got heavily regulated after 2008, the, the potential competitors couldn't afford to compete with them. So the bigger the banks were, the more they could spread the overhead of dealing with the regulation and it ended up increasing the monopoly power. And the same thing could happen here. If they over-regulate and they don't do it properly, no matter how much Ms. Khan wants to hurt these people, she might actually help them by making the cost of competing with them so difficult that it actually enhances their monopoly status is not. Now, I'm not saying that's gonna happen, but I'd say it's very possible and that's a work in progress that needs to be analyzed. Crypto, I'm a 68 year old dinosaur, so I'm not sure I should be saying too much about it. Um, I bought some uh, last year in the early stage of the pandemic when Congress started acting crazy um, and it was down at 6,500 and 
I heard from another money manager that in point of fact, that when it went from 17,000 to 3,000, 85% of the people still own it and realize that are these like religious zealots that own this stuff and they never sell it. Um, so I, I, it's a funny story. I was gonna buy a hundred million of it, even though I didn't really believe in it because I thought the risk reward was quite good. It took me a week and a half to buy 20 million of it. Um, I sold it all at 35,000 and uh, like a month later, it was 65,000 and, and I was just like beside myself because I left hundreds of millions of dollars on the table. But I don't know, this, this ransomware thing has really shaken me and I don't feel, it's not like there's some great societal benefit from Bitcoin and you've now got, it's, it, if it was a country, it's the 31st largest energy consumer, the miners of this stuff. Mm -hmm. And now you've got it being used for ransomware by criminals. I will be very surprised if the government doesn't crack down on this with regulation, um, simply because the central banks don't want it because it's a threat to their monopoly power with money. And this is the perfect excuse to act. I will say this, even though I don't, for that reason, I don't own any crypto right now which I could not have said to you two months ago. Um, I do think that the blockchain, so crypto technology, the best and the brightest are coming out of Stanford and MIT. And there's thousands of these kids working on the problem. And I don't think it'll be as big as the internet, but I think it will be big and there'll be a new payment system and a new world derived around this. Probably the companies you wanna invest in you'll catch them at Rockefeller because there'll be stuff that hasn't even been founded yet by some of these 26 year olds. But I'm not sure I believe in this stuff as a currency, but I do believe in the platform of the blockchain. Great. That's a long winded answer from some- No, that's a good question. It's so dangerous. Yeah, I think in, among the chief investment officers, we're trying to figure out, is it a new asset class, but it's so volatile, but I do think the blockchain underlying it is very interesting. There's a couple of questions which follow up on your um, question, your notes on inflation. So um, there's one, could you share your current thinking on US inflation and whether you think Powell's stance that the current rise in inflation will prove quote transitory and what assets do you think makes sense in a higher inflationary environment if Powell is wrong? And there was also a question about gold which also comes up in a conversation about inflation. So what's your thoughts here? Um, I don't know whether inflation is going to be transitory. I promise you, Powell doesn't know. He may think he knows, but he doesn't. Um, but I do think his policy is incredibly reckless because if in fact we have inflation, it's going to cause all sorts of problems. One of which we already alluded to earlier, the stuff Jeff and I went around talking about if the cost of money were to go up five or 6%, the interest costs alone could bankrupt our country. So I don't quite know why they're rooting for this inflation. But if I went back to Professor Shipman and Freeman's class, um, when you have this kind of fiscal stimulus, by the way, the infrastructure bill just, they announced they've made a deal on. So if, if you get the continued government spending we're getting and the Fed financing it, uh, economics 101, maybe that doesn't work anymore, but with all the shortages out there after the pandemic, and now everybody talking about inflation, which I don't remember since the 70s, my Pittsburgh friends who, have, who make like 50,000 a year, they're obsessed. Everybody has a story about the gasoline or this or that. Uh, the wealthy friends are talking about the restaurants. Once people start talking about inflation, been my experience, it's already too late. I have a partner here from Argentina and Powell is under the illusion that if inflation really starts to ramp up, he can stop it. If inflation is in fact not gonna be transitory, he's already way too late. And I'm not sure what this is all about because we have nominal growth at 11%, which is the highest it's been in 50 years. Um, and the story was, 
we wanted inflation up from one seven to two. I don't know what difference that would have made, but we've already done that. So it's almost like they're embarrassed that they said this stuff and now they have to stick with it. But I think the policy is incredibly dangerous, but this is something I really need to be, I would say open-minded on and cognizant of because inflation goes up, obviously you don't wanna own bonds. You don't wanna own equities. Um, there are certain commodities, counterintuitively, you may not want to own like gold because interest rates will go up and gold trades more off the interest rates. But there will be things you can own, um, certainly commodity-oriented companies and then what I would call real commodities. But inflation will just be a very difficult. You know how everything's been going up the last two years? It doesn't matter what it is. It can be GameStop. It, it could be yeah. bonds. Um, it will probably be more of the opposite. So the one thing we should not be rooting for, unless you have the ability to short fixed income, um, which most people don't have the stomach for, is inflation. And I think it is confusing. So, for instance, copper uh, is, you know, there, yesterday there was a whole thing about how China is releasing, the, you know, their copper um, and that's bringing down the price it should be with the electric vehicle is a sort of interesting thing, but it's very volatile. There's many factors. There's a number of questions from younger alums which ask about careers in finance, and you have been really successful in identifying um, talented young managers who are starting out with a small amount of money. You're also very adamant that large pools of money can also can hinder great investment um, returns. So what characteristics do you look for in identifying a good investor when you talk about these kids with high IQs and stuff? What are the characteristics you look for when you're, um, when you're identifying a good um, entry level uh, investor or starting many, out? Many that I described in a woman about half an hour ago named Paula <laughs> Valent. Um, <laughs> they you. have to have an extreme passion for the business because this is a business that some people just love and you can't compete against people that love the business if you don't love it. They're gonna outwork you. They're gonna outthink you, you're gonna outcompete you. They also have to be extremely competitive. They have to be sore losers. They have to want to win. Notice I haven't even gotten to IQ yet. <laughs> I think anything over 125, 130, it doesn't hurt you, but it's, it's largely superfluous. I would also say they can have an ego, but they have to know how to check it at the door. You have to be open-minded because this is a business where things happen that you didn't anticipate and you can't be stuck and start making up reasons why you have a position. You will just lose a lot of money. And finally, um, they've got to be, they've got to be able to think out the box and not with the crowd, because if you're in the crowd, those positions are already owned by everyone. And the only thing that could happen is less people can own them than do now. And it's not easy to fight your emotions in the crowd, but that's a big piece of it is have the discipline to fight your emotions and go against the crowd. Because when a, when a dress goes down in the store in price, I'm sure Paula, you wanna buy it. The strange, strange thing about the stock market, my first boss used to say, the higher they go, the cheaper they look. In this business, when prices go up, you want to buy, and when they go down, you want to sell. And you've got to you've got to look for a person that is able to fight that emotion and go the other way when it's appropriate. Um, also, I have some questions for you. There's probably some in there for you too. Uh, well, let's talk about China a little bit because, as you know, um, we do have venture capital in China, and I remember when we first presented it, you're a little skeptical. But um, China has been a good returning, you know, everything from Alibaba to Tencent to some of the things that are happening in the consumer. But she is actually cracking down in a lot of areas and also the politics of China. There's a couple of questions about emerging markets and also policy um, in between China. So what's your thought? Are you bullish on China? Or um, I happen to think that there's really interesting um, consumer and uh, I, you know, tech happening in China because they want to be insulated. They don't want to have to rely on the U.S. or external. They want to be strong. But what's your view on China right now? China is a real enigma. Um, 
because on the one hand, um, it's the most, if you go over there, Shanghai is like New York on crack in terms of energy. Uh, the entrepreneurial spirit, the, the energy, it's just fabulous and all these young entrepreneurs and they really do have a capitalist spirit, even though they're working within this communist dictatorship. And I'm sure there's going to be a lot of innovation. And as you say, now that the two supply chains have been severed, um, they'll have their own cloud, they'll have this, so that there's a lot of opportunity. On the other hand, um, I think the larger well-established companies are becoming increasingly difficult because my partner said it best, there's only room for one monopolist in China, and that's government. And if you get to the status of Alibaba or Tencent, um, he's going to be a rent seeker and not only take some of your profits, he's going to make sure um, you don't become bigger in terms of image than him. So I guess the simplistic answer, and it's way too simplistic, is I don't want to own the incumbents, but I do want to own the challengers. And I do think if you find great VC managers like Sequoia or, or Chase Coleman who have been over there, they're probably going to find some very dynamic companies and you'll get some great returns in the next 10 years. But I think the top-down thing is becoming more and more difficult because he has really proved himself to be a true Maoist. Interesting. Um, there's a couple of questions on um, Bowdoin, um, if they should, um, it says, should Bowdoin offer a class, a course that actually invests several million of real endowment money in order to teach and train the generation of analysts and portfolio managers? I'm not sure I agree with that because I think students go away for the summer. And as you know, investing is like a full-time job. There's no break. You have to always be aware of the market. But what's your, if you were going to, um, I always, I work with a lot of students. I tell them to read the Wall Street Journal, to read the FT, to know what the interest rate is and all that. But what would you encourage, like you took the economics class to be able to read the newspaper. What would you encourage some, a student at Bowdoin who's interested in finding more out if this is the career they want? What, would, what should they do? Should we offer a class? Should we, you know, what would you recommend? I don't like the class idea. They have the rest of their lives to run live money. I, I love your suggestion. Read the Wall Street Journal. Maybe they can trade a little stuff on their own. Please make it be a little bit because um, the best way to learn is to lose. One tends to learn more from their losses than they do from their gains. But uh, yeah, I think Bowdoin is a place to teach you how to think as opposed to uh, how to do something. Uh, and, you know, I think that's something to do post Bowdoin, not more in terms of actual classwork. So as you look forward for Bowdoin, um, there are challenges. We're just coming out of a pandemic. Some people think it would be the roaring 20s, but education, you know, the college had to spend lots of money in the budget on testing and things like that. Um, what do you think the most important thing going forward for Bowdoin um, is to, you know, right now, in it, this is some amazing statistics. In 1991, when you joined, the um, financial aid budget was uh, just about, what was it? It's very small. But anyways, right now, the financial aid budget represents 46% of the budget of the endowment and it's devoted to that which I'm really proud of because students can come to Bowdoin that never Should could be. be able to before but I know we're dealing with diversity we're dealing with um, you know women uh, uh, you know on corporate boards there's all these issues that are floating around what should the college be focused on going forward do you think as far as how the endowment supports it well I'm biased I have a German last name so I'm incredibly fiscally conservative, but thanks to you, we're in a really good place. Um, probably the best place we've ever been with, with in regards to being able to not, not take into account uh, the wealth and individual coming in so we can get the best of the brightest and the most diverse class we want if, if that's what we want. So, but I, you know, I would say one of the things I've seen in the past with other boards I've been on when there's a big windfall um, like you've created for us, particularly in the last 12 months, resist the temptation to go out and spend it. 
um, because rainy days come and something very well worthwhile may come. But I would also consider not lurching, but thinking about we're now in a position to take on um, Williams, and, Williams and Amherst, which we've never been. They were like pie in the sky when I went to Bowdoin. We're now at the very least snipping at their heels. Um, you know, I would, I would think seriously about in terms of faculty student ratio, that kind of stuff, trying to take advantage of this and move up our competitive position given our financial windfall relative to these other institutions. But I'm not even on the board, I'm not running the college and leave that up to Mr. White who introduced us earlier and, and obviously Clayton Rose. Um, one other issue before we run out of time, which I think is very important, is climate change, the net zero. I'm on the board of MSCI. We're spending a lot of time. Uh, Mark Carney just spoke to the board. I'm doing a lot of research on company transparency. We just listened to Chris Hahn, who's very active in um, climate change. How do you think that's going to infect, uh, impact the investment? I know Bowdoin has very little in, um, you know, we've stopped investing in fossil fuels uh, going forward, but how do you think the, the um, net zero and some of the initiatives, what Bill Gates and some of them are talking about it on the environment, how does that impact the endowment and the opportunity set? Well, the way you make money in the markets is you anticipate change. Um, you can't buy a security because of its current circumstances. You have to envision those circumstances 18 to 24 months ahead. And this global movement um, to try and decarbonize the world is going to create tremendous change in company after company and sector after sector. And it has to become, you know, an integral part of the analysis of many, many industries on the negative side and the positive side. And then, of course, you got to figure out, is that already priced into the market? When mm -hmm. change is this big, it generally isn't. You think you're in the eighth inning and you're in like the third inning. But um, we talk about innovation in the software and other space. There'll be innovation in in the carbon space. And uh, so yeah, I think it's many of our many thing. of our venture capital funds are looking and seeing great opportunities there. Yeah, I think it's a big should be a big part of anybody's process who's trying to make money. Yeah, so I know we're almost, we're out of time and I think I need to hand this over back to Bob, but Stan, it has been an honor and a pleasure. You're still a legend at Bowdoin. They should name a, a game room after you here, but um, thank you. And thank you for your mentorship of me because I couldn't have done, or we couldn't have done what we did without your counsel. So Bob, I leave it to you. All right, well, thank you, uh, Paula. First of all, thank you for leading today's discussion, Paula, and for your tremendous service to the college and as Stan pointed out, uh, your, your hard work and the performance has made a huge difference and allows Bowdoin to do things that we never would have envisioned um, many, many years ago. So thank you for that and best wishes, Paula, in your next chapter uh, at Rockefeller. We'll be watching and, 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 and um, don't be a stranger. Again, thank you. And Dr. Druckenmiller, uh, thanks for taking time today to share your insights and your very valuable thoughts and also Stan, Thanks for all you do and have done for this college for so many years. Um, we are all very uh, indebted to what you've done and continue to do. And, and also, Stan, um, I know everybody enjoyed hearing from you today. And for those who are on, I hope you enjoyed the session. Thank you for your interest and, uh, and for your continued support of the college. Thank, thank you for stewarding the college. It's, I don't think it's quite a thankless job, but it's not thank enough. And I'm being a Bowdoin alumni, I could not be more happy with uh, you in charge in terms of thinking our, of our future. And also for all the polar bears on the, um, you'll notice whenever Stan talks on the press or something, he wears a polar bear tie. Um, and so I always notice on CNBC or whenever he's being interviewed, that polar bear, uh, that polar bear. Well, look at the polar bears on Bob's uh, bookcase. We're, by, yeah, we're, we're, cult. we're all a cult. I have a all, we are. I mean, <laughs> Paul is over there. We all are a cult. Well, yeah. from one member of the cult to all the rest of the members of the cult, thanks again for today's session. Be well, Paul and Stan. Thanks again. We'll see you soon. Thanks, thanks everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye.